I grew up in a small town. The sort of place where bad things aren't supposed to happen. That's what we like to tell ourselves, anyways. But something terrible did happen. Something I don't ever want to talk about. Something that I haven't shared with anyone since it happened. Hollow's End has old roots. Lots of folklore and history surrounds this place. Ruins of old structures, churches and government buildings and other ancient things lost to time dot the sprawling forested landscape of our town. As children, grown-ups would occasionally tell us tales detailing the origins of these ruins. Stories often steeped in magic, detailing horrifying events that didn't add up. Creatures coming from the wilderness at night. Trials of witch women who kidnapped children. Farm hands who were never seen again. It wasn't until later on in life that I realized most towns don't have those types of stories. Those recollections are quite unique to our town. Still, as a kid, my favorite stories were always the scariest. The one about the sanctuary deep within the local forest especially caught the interest of everyone my age when we heard about it. The Temple of Doom had recently come out when I learned about the place from a speaker at school during a local history class. Most of us had never heard the story and word spread like wildfire about the mysterious ruins in the forest that could no longer be found. Sinister things had happened there, according to the friendly-looking, bespectacled man who stood in front of our class. A coven, or a guild of some kind, had practiced their dark arts in that place, held rituals and ceremonies hidden from the public eye. People had gone missing from the nearby village, and a couple hundred years ago, a slew of questions began to arise about what exactly was happening at this temple of evil which existed deep within the forest. The local townspeople had raided the sanctuary, invading the dark temple, and put the inhabitants of the place to death in the most horrifying ways imaginable. The eldest and wisest among them, their leader, had escaped, their identity never known to the public. Ever since that day, the town had been cursed, at least according to the local legends. This patch of forest where the ancient sanctuary had once stood was close to my house. Despite the f terrifying stories, we would frequently play in those woods when I was a kid. My parents would warn us about playing in the forest after dark, saying never to stay past sunset. But during the daytime, we were free to explore. It was a wide stretch of woodland that seemed to go on forever, at least according to our young eyes. We managed to find new things within it every day. We built forts in the fallen trees and rode our bikes down the steep hills that lined the gullies and the valleys within. Sword fight each other with fallen branches, play with matches, and occasionally light fireworks. Essentially all the typical dumb activities of that age that go along with being left alone in the woods. It was our getaway. Our private, natural playground that extended for acres. We rarely saw anyone out there. One summer day I was walking through it with my friends Brad and Tom. I came across another kid who looked vaguely familiar from around town, but who I didn't know very well. He was walking alone in the forest and looked kind of sad all by himself. Hey man, I said, trying to sound friendly. You okay? When he looked up, I could see he'd been crying, and I suddenly felt even worse for him. Sorry, he said, sniffling, wiping his nose with his sleeve and getting stretchy lengths of snot all over it. It's so dumb. I moved here a while ago, and I still don't know anybody. My friends live a thousand miles away, and I'm stuck here by myself. I put my hand reassuringly on his shoulder and asked him what his name was. Ned, he told me, wiping his eyes. Hey, Ned, I'm Jordan. This is Brad and Tom. We can be your friends, how about that, huh? Simple enough, right? 
I looked over and saw Brad and Tom weren't objecting. You could tell they felt bad for the kid, too. For real? Yeah, man, no worries. Well, what were you guys doing? You mind if I tag along? We told him that we'd planned to go look for the lost ruins of the ancient temple in the forest. It was early on a Sunday morning, and we had the whole day ahead of us, but we had no idea where to start looking, only knowing that it was somewhere within the woods where we were. Actually, I might be able to help, said Ned. My mom is a bit of a history nerd, and I asked her about it after school yesterday. She told me it was to the west, probably. Over that hill, I'd say. Oh, thanks, Ned. It's a good thing you're here. You can be our navigator, okay? So we set off enthusiastically, our pace quick, almost running at first. Then our legs grew tired and we started to slow our pace. After walking for an hour or more, the four of us decided to take a little rest. Come across a thickly overgrown section of the brush and wanted to stop for a while before going any deeper. I was starting to get tired of walking and was considering saying we should stop for the day when Ned spoke up. You guys see that? It's like a reflection. I turned and saw the glint of glass in the distance immediately. What is that? Brad asked. I have no idea. We got up and started walking through the dense shrubbery towards, towards the reflection. It was so dark in the trees it was hard to see. Difficult to move in the thick overgrowth, but pushed through. Branches seemed to grab at my clothing, and I had to fight hard against them to get past. There were thorn bushes which tore my skin, and the barbs went into my face like fish hooks, refusing to come out. Twisted and turned my head, trying to get the thorns out of my skin. My hands trapped at my sides by the brush. Eventually, I managed to free myself, ripping and tearing my face and arms to bloody shreds in the process. I looked down and saw I was scratched and red with blood, but I managed to get out through the thorns and thistles and push through, finally coming out into an opening. Tom and Brad made their way out of the forest next and stumbled out looking even worse than I did, bloodied and scratched by the thorns. They were trembling and out of breath, panting from exertion. Wow, that was pretty gnarly. Yeah, no kidding. Ned came through next, his skinny body twisting and angling itself to come through the thorn bushes without much visible, visible damage. Only a few small cuts to his wrists. He fixed his glasses, combed back his hair with his hands, and joined us in the clearing. I looked up and saw what had been reflecting the light at us through the trees. It, wasn't a, it was the window of an old house. The place wasn't a simple cottage or a shack in the woods, either. It was a house. Run down and ugly looking, the roof sagging down in the middle, but a house nonetheless. The siding had been painted red at some point in the past, I guessed, and taken on a bit of a dusty, dingy brown shade after years of neglect. Several of the windows were broken, but others remained intact. Shutters were hanging loose and askew, and the whole place had a very haunted, lonely vibe to it that I didn't like. Whoa, there's a house out here? Who the hell builds a house in the middle of the forest? I couldn't answer that question, but guessed it was someone who really, really wanted to be left alone. Shivers ran down my spine thinking about that, and I began to feel more and more afraid. It took a very committed hermit to craft a place like this. The retreat was as secluded as it gets. Guys, maybe we should go. You never know. There could be someone still living in there. The three of us stared at the entrance, and I noticed the door was ajar, hanging open invitingly, swaying in the breeze as if it were waving, beckoning us to come in. Nobody lives here, man. It's abandoned. Just look at it. Brad started walking the short distance towards the house, and I felt the queasiness brewing in the pit in my stomach as I followed after him. When we got to the doorway, Brad hesitated, but only for a second before stepping inside the echoing, empty building. Tom went in next, then Ned. I followed, to, followed hesitantly after, telling myself not to be afraid. 
Wooden floors creaked and squeaked beneath our feet as we went to the dark, dusty old house. Quiet inside except for the echoing sounds of our footsteps. Empty aside from a few items. Old cast iron frying pan which was rusted and covered in dust. Spider webs been left on the floor. We went deeper into the dark, dilapidated old house to find a living area on the main floor. An old newspaper was scattered on the rug, parts of it laying open on a busted, hole-covered couch as if someone had just been reading it. But the yellowed paper looked decades old. A few other pieces of ancient, broken furniture haphazardly tipped over on their sides. Filthy, broken mirror. Nothing that suggested anyone might actually still live there. I turned around and jumped, startled at the sight of someone standing in one of the dark corners of the room watching us. A person dressed entirely in black, their pale, wrinkled face only barely visible in the shadows. I screamed, pointing at the corner where the thing stood watching, but then I realized it was his only old coat stand with a wrinkled white hat hanging from it. Brad, Ned, and Tom had a good laugh at that. We started backtracking towards the main entrance and saw there was a couple closed doors off the main hallway. First one located next to the front door. Brad, the daredevil that he was, decided he would open it. I watched as he twisted the knob slowly and carefully, opening the door to reveal a small, darkened space. It appeared empty aside from an old broom and some old wire clothes hangers. Boring, said Brad. I didn't share his sentiment, the whole place felt off to me. Making the hairs stand up on the back of my neck made me feel nauseous, cold, and sweaty at the same time. Ned walked over to the front door. He took a deep breath and raised a trembling hand to open it. Darkness was gradually flooded with dim light as he pushed open the wooden door, its rusted hinges squealing. Just an old bathroom, said Ned, looking inside. You guys want to go check out the upstairs? Hang on, what's that? Tom asked, eyeing the wall at the far corner of the darkened bathroom. We all crowded around and looked to see immediately what he'd notice. A piece of vermilion fabric was showing from beneath the baseboard near the bathtub. What the hell? March Brad marched in and pulled on the fabric to pick it up. It stuck. That was when I noticed the long, rounded black marks on the floor. Guys, I think this wall might not really be a wall. They all looked at me and followed my gaze down to the dark marks on the floor, barely visible in the black room. Oh, okay, now things are getting creepy. Is this a secret passage or something? Only one way to find out. Let's try to get it open. Spent the next few minutes pulling on various fixtures and getting grossed out when cockroaches and mice would occasionally scamper and skitter around us and on us. But eventually someone figured it out. It must have been Ned. He pulled on the chain which was connected to the plug in the bathroom sink and surprisingly a sound began like gears ticking. The entire wall began to swing in towards us and we had to take a step back to let it open. A very well hidden secret doorway revealed an ancient looking set of stairs which went downwards for a long, long time. A small amount of light quickly dissipated and nothing could be seen below in that horrifying pit of darkness. Immediately I lost any courage I had left. This was beyond anything we were prepared for, but we found what we were looking for. We're almost sure of that. Hidden beneath this well camouflaged house in the woods, existing against all common sense, were the subterranean ruins of the ancient sanctuary we'd learned about in history class. Check out those carvings on the walls, exclaimed Ned, remaining behind us in the small space. We moved forward and saw there were indeed carvings, elaborate reliefs and images hewn from the stone adorning the passageway leading down. The three of us crowded around the doorway, scared and excited, looking at the carvings. They showed terrible images and I wondered immediately why anyone would want to make such art depicting such brutal violence. Such darkness. I guess my grandpa was right about the ruins being over in this direction. You guys want to go down and check it out? A tingling sensation was covering my entire body. Goosebumps rising on my skin. Something about Ned's voice wasn't quite right. 
Hadn't he said it was his mom? Who's the history nerd? She was the one who told him in which direction the temple ruins lay. Or was I mistaken? I thought it was your mom who said it was here. Oops. I heard Ned mutter quickly to himself. Got my stories mixed up. Oh well. Doesn't matter. Suddenly I felt him push me from behind with such force that I went stumbling forward into Brad and Tom, off balance and unable to stop myself from falling over the precipice. The three of us tumbled violently and bone-shatteringly downwards into the blackness below, crashing, bouncing against the hard rock and sharp angles. Eventually we reached the floor down below, careening into the wall opposite the stairs with such force that it felt as if my jaw had shattered. My ears were ringing and I immediately had an awful headache that pierced my brain like a spike through the temple. I was barely conscious and in such horrible agony that I barely registered the demented laughter coming from up above for a few long moments. Of course, it was Ned. It had been him from the beginning. He had led us down into this dark temple in the forest just like the terrifying stories we'd heard in history class. I heard the murmur of echoing voices and footsteps approaching in the dark. And my heart began to pound with fear like never before the hell had we gotten ourselves into? Have you ever trusted someone and gotten burned? Helped someone? Had your kindness repaid with suffering? Well then you can relate to how I was feeling when I woke up in the blackness beneath the abandoned house in the woods. The rough stone floor was cold beneath me and I struggled to focus my aching head swimming in the darkness. Had I lost consciousness for a brief second? Yes, it seemed as if I had. We were in a house, I remembered that. But this wasn't a house. It was a terrible, dark, cavernous dungeon sort of place that I didn't like at all. Not one bit. And the sound of footsteps drawing near made my heart jackhammer with fear, knowing immediately that they did not belong to someone friendly. There had been an abandoned house in the woods. We had gone inside. Me, Brad, and Tom. Except there had been someone else with us. Ned. It all came flooding back to me in an instant, and with it came pounding, incessant pain in my temples. I tried to get into my feet and fell backwards off balance. The footsteps were getting closer. I tried to shake Brad and Tom, whispering to them, Get up, get up, there's someone coming. Tom grunted, looked like maybe he was going to wake up, but Brad just lay there looking pale and cold. He didn't make a sound, his breathing shallow and barely noticeable. The flame of a torch was getting closer, turning into a f from a firefly into a candle wick in size, and I immediately hid. I ran to the first concealed place I could find, beneath the stone stairs just a few yards away, managing to wedge myself into the tight space just before the approaching men were within range to see me. Looks like Nettie screwed up again, one of the men said, laughing. He kicked Tom with his shoe and he groaned and blinked his eyes groggily, seeming not to understand what was happening. He'll get it one of these days. Give him a break, he's just a kid. Get him upstairs to the pitfall, that's all he's got to do. Pull the damn lever when they're in the bedroom and we don't have to have these sorts of problems. He kicked Tom again harder this time. That's why we built the damn thing. Wouldn't have bothered if he was just gonna keep shoving them down the stairs. Yep. At least this one's knocked out cold. There were three of them. All dressed in long, hooded vermilion robes, the same color as the scrap of fabric we'd found beneath the hidden door in the bathroom. It was all starting to come together as I overheard them talking. Ned was the one who lured kids out into the forest to find the abandoned house. 
And they were making people disappear in the place. Just like the stories we heard about in history class. But we weren't supposed to see the hidden door in the bathroom, I surmised. Last thing he'd said before we noticed the scrap of fabric and scuff marks on the floor, indicating the secret passage was there, was that we should go check the upstairs. So the real trap door, or whatever it was that dropped people down to this dungeon, was actually up there, which meant the door we'd come through had not been used for its intended purpose. Was that the way these evil people out got in and out of here? And if it was, maybe there was a latch or a lever that would let me out. Perhaps there was hope for me after all. But I couldn't just leave my friends. As scared as I was, I needed to see what was going to happen to them. And if I could still save them. Besides, Ned was still up in the house for all I knew. He hadn't followed us and so had perhaps taken some other route down into the dungeon. There was also still a chance he was up there waiting for us to try and escape. I couldn't take the chance. The terrible headache was making it difficult to think. I couldn't focus and only knew that I wanted to try and help my friends, as terrified as I was. So when the three men picked up my friends and started to carry them away, I followed after at a distance. I felt as if I was unsafe no matter what I did, so my panicked mind instinctively wanted to try to stay with my friends and with the light. That's all I can say to justify it in retrospect. I wish I had just run and taken my chances up in the house with Ned, though, and... I'll never be able to unsee the things that happened after that. I followed the men, dragging my friends away, quickly realizing I would have to keep track of each turn as the maze-like subterranean tunnels seemed to go on forever. To help myself get back, I left a penny from my pocket and each left for right. Heads for left, tails for right. The place was ancient by the looks of it and more elaborate than anyone could have imagined. There were hieroglyphics, and murals, symbols, and colorful imagery was painted on the walls, but it could be barely glimpsed in the darkness. I got the impression that there was once a great society living beneath the ground here, unknown and unmentioned in the history books. The torchlight flickered and dissipated up ahead, and I had to pick up the pace to keep up with the men, terrified of being left alone in this dark maze, where I would no doubt roam lost forever. I realized when I heard Tom waking up and screaming that they were hurrying their pace because he was fighting and struggling with them. Suddenly they turned a corner and they were gone. I caught up and looked around the sharp rock wall to see a vast open chamber. The throne and the dais were ornate purple and black jewels were adorning the throne. Candlelit chandeliers hung suspended from the ceiling and the huge room echoed with the movements of the hooded men. There was someone sitting up on the throne dressed in a long, hooded vermilion robe, their face shrouded in darkness. The person sat waiting, looking impatient. Two smaller thrones were set up on either side of this person, who I assumed was the leader of the group. You've done well once again. What have you brought us this time, servants of the many-legged god? Came a feminine voice from the center throne. Two young spirits, mother of mothers, we bring them to you so that you may mold them to your purposes, to the purposes of the Dark Temple. May they bring you many years of servitude, and may their spirits and wills be easily broken. The hooded woman on the throne in the center raised her long hand up and summoned the men to come forward. They did, appearing cautious and afraid. Closer. They went closer. The mother of mothers, as the man had called her, did not seem pleased after all. She reached out and grabbed the man by the throat, and the other two backed away, trembling. How exactly am I supposed to make a life-bonded servant of a dead boy? 
My heart stopped in my chest for a moment hearing that. Brad had looked pale and his breathing had been shallow after the fall down the stairs. Maybe now it had stopped entirely. It was pretty rough, after all. She continued to strangle the man with one strong hand, and I realized suddenly how tall she was. She towered over the man when she stood up, probably over seven feet. She released her grip for a few moments to let him speak. I'm sorry, Mother. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. It was Ned. The boy is obstinate, but I will teach him. I will teach him to be better. I swear. I will make him understand. You peddle in excuses and lies, Solomon. Take your note for your next life. This is far less than the many-legged god deserves. The man began to scream in shrill cries of terror as he realized he was not going to get away. She was done with him. Now, we've been patient enough with you. You were told long ago to, to take responsibility for your charges. You've forsaken that responsibility. The man screamed, No, please, give me another chance. Don't do this. The woman was still holding him by the throat, tilting her head as she examined him. As the man thrashed and bucked, trying to get away from her, the woman began to emit a low, melodious, clicking sound. The movie Predator came out a few years later. I remember jumping when I heard the sound the creature in that movie had made because it was so similar. The other two women had been seated in their thrones upon the dais began to emit this low, clicking groan as well. The sound grew louder and louder as the ground seemed to rumble and shake beneath my feet. I noticed then how the ornately carved stone walls had large sewer rate sized holes in them, cleanly hollowed out and dark inside. And from a few of these black holes came the shapes of creatures unlike anything I had seen before. They were huge, colorless millipedes with mouths full of sharp teeth. Their eyes glowed a pale blue shade, brimming with keen intelligence, but moreover, hunger. These creatures seemed to sniff the air and came down in weaving serpentine motions towards the man, still thrashing and screaming as the hooded woman held him by the neck. Their many legs skittered and clawed at the air. Tom was also fully awake now. I could see he was being held by the two remaining men and was fighting hard against them to get away, seeing the unnatural creatures that were lurking in this dark underground temple of despair. More and more of the giant millipede creatures were emerging from their holes, and they lunged at the hooded man and began to strike him in bloody, thirsty attacks, swarming him like a hive of snakes. The crimson fluid sprayed from his neck as they tore off his head and fought over like hyenas, nipping and snapping at each other to gain the tourist's morsels. All courage vanished from me as I saw this bewildering and terrifying scene occur before my eyes. Even at a distance, the worst of things obscured by darkness, I will never forget what I saw. I will have nightmares about it forever, especially knowing that those carnivorous creatures still reside down there beneath my feet, in the bowels below the town. Once the bloodshed was over, the massive millipedes retreated back into their respective holes, and I saw that Tom had been knocked unconscious by one of the two remaining men. He was a goner, I realized. There was no way I could save him by myself. My best bet was to retreat, take my chances against Ned up in the house. I could try to get the authorities come back and help if anyone believed me. But then I turned around and saw Ned was standing just behind me. An unlit torch held in his hands which he looked about ready to swing at my head. Startled I jumped back and lunged just as he lunged at me swinging the torch. Luckily he missed and wound up stumbling off balance. Since I was larger than him I managed to use his momentum against him and pushed him while spinning out of the way probably the best thing that could have possibly happened since I caught him off guard by turning around just as he was bully, fully about to commit taking a swing at me. Ned missed completely and flew past me to wind up sprawled on the floor. I began to run immediately knowing what was going to happen next. Surely enough, Ned began to scream for the other men to come and help, yelling, Dad, he's getting away. 
As I ran, I heard the clicking, groaning, rumbling sound begin from the hooded women once again. The walls around me began to shake as I raced back through the underground tunnels towards the staircase. I just hoped I was right, and it was the way out. The entire tum tunnel was rumbling and quaking all around me, making me lose my balance and stumble as I ran. Behind me, I could hear the voices of my pursuers and could see the flickering light from their torches. First, I had a very strong feeling that I was not going to make it far, but it turned out I had the upper hand in the darkness, especially since I had marked my path earlier. It's easy enough to remember the first turns, so when I saw the pennies on the ground in the dim light, I knew which way to go instinctively. This threw off my pursuers and gave me hope. I realized they could not see me in the darkness once I was far enough away. They probably assumed I would get lost in the tunnels and that I had no idea where I was going. Little did they know that I was headed straight back towards the exit. They slowed down behind me in the labyrinthian tunnels and eventually their voices faded off into the distance. I made it back to the stairs and climbed up the steep, crumbling steps. At the top, I saw the secret door leading to the bathroom in the abandoned house where we'd come in. There was a chain on the other side. We'd pulled to get in, hidden to look like a sink plug. I searched for a similar mechanism on this side. On the left, I finally found it. Pulling on it, I heard the door begin to slide open. Then voices were coming from me behind me again, and the clicking sound like a thousand legs on stone, insectile but louder. Looking down the stairs over my shoulder with a hurried glance, I saw the man from our history class who had told us about the Dark Temple. He was one of them, perhaps Ned's dad. Everything had been orchestrated to get us out here, to trap us down here. This place was an unholy sanctuary to some ancient and terrible god, subterranean and evil, the many-legged god. The people who lived down here had their own system, their own world. I wanted no part of it. They needed fresh blood, though, and they were intent on keeping their secret. The bespectacled man raced the steps towards me, not seeing what was coming out of the stonework on either side of my head. I saw the holes bore out the stone walls on either side of me, the size of sewer grates. And as the door slowly opened, I saw the creatures emerge from their burrows, closing in on me their antennae twitching and mandibles clicking as they sniffed the air. The man reached me without seeing the creatures emerging from the shadows. He lunged at me and I ducked just as he did so. All I heard was screaming as the creatures attacked him, too hungry to pass up a meal. His blood spraying the walls in my face with warm crimson fluid. As the huge millipedes attacked the hooded man, I moved as quickly as I could, out through the open door, and ran. Ned's screams mixed with his father's as I emerged in the bathroom of the abandoned house in the woods. I pulled the chain quickly, causing the secret door to slam shut behind me, closing off the madness it concealed. The wailing cries of pain and terror shut off abruptly as it closed and left it with the sound of my own horrified heartbeat pounding in my ears. The light of the sun blinded me when I left the house. It had been so dark down in the tunnels. But my eyes adjusted and I made my way through the painful thorny thicket and ran back home. As quickly as my legs would carry me, I ran, terrified of every sound I heard in the forest. Scared of every squirrel that rustled in the leaves and every bird that chirped in the branches thinking each one of them might be a millipede burrowing its way up from the underground to chase after me. No wonder my parents had said to stay out of the woods after dark. This thought it should have clued me in into what happened next. I should have realized that my parents knew more than what they were saying right from the beginning. I got home panting and out of breath and begged my mom and dad to call the police. I began to tell them what had happened to Tom and Brad and they just stopped me and shook their heads. They're getting bolder again, said my father, his eyes thoughtful, 
staring off into the distance. I told you they were past time for another cleansing, said my mother. They began making phone calls, stuffing rags into old liquor bottles. I assumed to make Molotov cocktails. Guns were being loaded and arranged on the table in an old, organized fashion, and grenades were being set beside them. I didn't even think my parents owned one gun, let alone this arsenal of warfare. I had never realized my parents were so badass. It'll be dark soon. We need to get moving, son, said my mom, strapping on a cobbler vest. Now, where did you say that abandoned house was? 